Welcome to our service this morning. My name's Russell, if I haven't met you before. And here at St. Luke's, we're a church that longs to see people find new life in Jesus and grow as his wholehearted disciples. Uh, if it's your t- first time with us, we are so glad you're here with us as well. Uh, we'd love to welcome you personally after the service. There's our welcome flag, our new here flag out the door. Please visit us after uh, so that we can help you feel welcome here at St. Luke's. Uh, well, we are midway through our vision series, and a little bit later, Brett is going to help us think about Matthew 25 and the mission that God has called us to as a church. Uh, but we're also going to sing, we're going to pray, we're going to hear from the Word, and a little bit later as well, we're going to hear uh, from Luke a little bit about uh, how mission shapes what we do here at St. Luke's. Uh, but we're going to stand and sing our first song uh, as we begin our service, so please stand and let's sing.
continue seeing together. moments of life around here now and there are just two for today. Uh, the first is that our AGM uh, is coming up on the 20th of March, not this Monday, next Monday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, it's a moment for us as a church to elect our parish representatives who represent us as a church uh, and as decisions are made. If you would like to nominate someone, you'd like to bring up a motion or anything like that, there are forms up the back on a table. Please do fill them out. They are due tomorrow. You need to have them in by then. Please go and fill it out. We'd love to see you there at our AGM. Uh, our other piece of life around here is Hype, our kids club. All the details are on the screen. Uh, but most importantly, if you'd like to sign up and get, have your kid have a shirt for Hype, uh, make sure to sign up today. We're ordering them tomorrow. Make sure you grab a flyer up the back, uh, sign up your kid. Uh, we would love to have your kids come along and join together and have some fun, hear from the Word, and be able to uh, share the good news of Jesus with their friends as they invite them along. 
Uh, well, I'm going to quickly uh, pray for Hype and pray for us as we consider how we might uh, be inviting our kids along to Hype. Uh, and as I do, James is going to come up to read the Bible. So let me pray. Father, we do uh, give you thanks for the missional opportunity that Hype is uh, to be able to invite kids along to hear about the good news of Jesus. Father, would you be with us as well as we uh, chat with uh, the parents of our kids, uh, the parents of our kids' friends. Father, use us that we might see many, many children come to hear the good news of the Lord Jesus at Hype. Uh, Father, as well, would you be with us as we hear from the Word. Father, help us to focus our minds and hearts in on it. Uh, God, by it, would you shape and change us for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Uh, today's Bible reading comes from Matthew 25, 14 to 30. Uh, you'll find it on page 1,414 in your bi pew Bibles. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags and to another one pack, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to one who has ten bags, for whoever has will be given more, and they will have in, a, have in abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Morning, everyone. My name is Brett. I'm senior minister here at St. Luke's. Um, yeah, great to have you with us. Thanks for reading for us, Jimmy. Uh, if I haven't met you before, I'd love to. I'll be out um, around the welcome area after the service. Come say hi. Uh, welcome to week number two in our vision series. Uh, we do this every year. Term one, take three weeks uh, where we recalibrate, reset, remind ourselves why we exist as a church, why God has planted us here and where we're going. And I'll pray for us as we start. Uh, Lord and Father, we praise you for this day that you have given us. May we use it to your glory. Uh, whatever our mornings have held so far, we pray that uh, we have a moment now of peace and rest in you and a moment uh, of uh, conviction uh, of your love for us and the work that you have called us to together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, will your church grow this year? Will your church grow this year? That was the abrasive question that was once put to me at a conference. Um, I was there with a bunch of other senior ministers. We were in this uh, session together, 
sitting in a circle and there were some, some grizzled, I would say, some seasoned other senior ministers who were running this session for us and one of them pointed their crooked finger at me and the other people in this group and asked that question, will your church grow this year? Sort of slightly embarrassing question. Everyone there felt a little bit nervous in how to respond. Uh, someone said, I hope so. And someone corrected them, I'm praying it will. Yeah, well done. Someone else corrected him, if the Lord wills it. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimate response, they just stood up and left at that point. What, what more is there to say? Uh, how, do you, how do you feel about the question? What about you? Will, will, is your church going to grow this year? Uh, I think the nerves in the room were perhaps that it seems not our business. I mean, we, we do a bunch of things together, we, we live faithfully, we read the Bible, but people becoming Christians, surely that's God's work. I mean, that's the mysterious work of the Spirit. Who are we to dictate what the Spirit will do in any given church, any given year? Uh, perhaps some of the nerves in the room were just because no one wanted to draw a line in the sand and disappoint themselves at the end of the year to look back and think, I was so confident, did we? Did we grow? How do you feel about the question? Is it even okay to talk about our church growing, people becoming Christians, aspiring to that? Would you even like to see it happen? Or as St. Luke said, aside, you think, this is, this is about right for me. Do you believe we have any role to play in it? We're in this, as I said, three-week vision series. We're letting the words of Jesus shape the culture, aspirations of our church. And today we're opening up the parable of the bags of gold. And we want to let it speak into the questions that I've been asking so far. So let's understand the parable. What we want to do first of all is set it in its context. Where's it happening in the story of Matthew? Uh, and it, for those who were here last week, you'll know that we're in this long sermon that Jesus speaks to his disciples. Uh, it's a long sermon that primarily addresses the destruction of the temple. And that's how the sermon begins. He tells his disciples it's going to happen in their generation. They have some questions about it. When will it happen? What are the signs? Jesus goes some way to answering these, but his primary burden in this sermon, what he wants to convey to the disciples is, what do you do while you wait? In the time you have left, before I come in judgment on the temple and there's this great political upheaval, what are you going to do with that time? Uh, last week we saw how the time was dangerous and difficult and the disciples were going to need to have Jesus' words and promises close at hand. They needed to go deeply into the words of Jesus, hold on to them, so that when the time came, they'll be ready. Uh, and today he continues the teaching about what they should do with the time they have, and he answers that question with seven parables. Some of these parables are very short, just a few sentences, some are much longer, like the one we're reading today. There's four parables about being watchful. You've got this parable about a fig tree changing its leaves in summer. You have parables about people in the field, about thieves in the night, about ten young women waiting for the bridegroom to arrive for the wedding party. They're four parables all about watching, being prepared for the day Jesus comes in judgment on the temple, being ready. They are, if you like, parables that concern what we were talking about last week. How do we prepare our hearts, st stay steadfast, stay calm, and prepare for the day of judgment? And then you have three more parables that are, are more about the work of the disciples while they wait. What's their vocation? What's the business they are in as they await Jesus to come in judgment? And the parable of the bags of gold is one of them. All right, a parable about the vocation of the disciples as they wait. Uh, so let's get into this parable. Uh, all of the parables that we are reading here begin with this sentence, wasn't in the Bible reading, it happened before the first parable, but it says, at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like. Okay, so that's the, that's the sentence that introduces the parables. So we're talking about that time, talking about something to do with Jesus coming in judgment, and the kingdom of heaven during that time. And Jesus says, it'll be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey. 
All right, so straight up, let's get these characters sorted in our heads. When you read parables, they're not allegories. You're not looking for everything in the parable to represent something in reality. But certainly the characters will represent someone. And immediately we know Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Uh, He's not speaking to the Pharisees here. He's not speaking to the crowds here. The disciples are the audience. And so it's likely this is a parable about Jesus and them, the master and his servants. And that makes pretty good sense of the wider context where Jesus has been speaking about a time when he is absent and then will return in judgment on the temple. So here we have a setup of Jesus as the master of this household, this estate, his disciples as these servants, and the time when, between when he goes and when he returns, the time between the promise made and the promise kept. It's a parable about what they are to do with the time they have. Now, in the parable, this man, this household owner, entrusts his wealth to his servants. Five bags to one, two bags to another. The third gets one bag. And when we read entrusts his wealth to his servants, uh, what we must hear there is the, the master saying, put this gold to work. Do the work of the estate. It's not just look after it, it's not protect it, it's they are to conduct the business of the master when he leaves. They are now in charge of the estate. The master expects to return and find more than what he left. They do his business while he's away. And this is true for the first two servants, the first and the second servant, they put the gold they've been given to work. They do exactly what the master expected them to do, and wonderfully, the gold doubles, but a third doesn't. The man who had received one went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. And we read that the master is gone for a long time. We're not told exactly what our long time means, but I'm vibing years. Are you vibing years? It's kind of what I just feel like a long time might mean here. I don't think it's just a week. I think it's the years that the master is away. But he does return, and the time comes to settle his accounts. Uh, These three servants, they assemble. It's great news for the first two servants. They've done exactly as was expected of them. They've continued his work in his absence. They've overseen the growth of this estate. And even though the profit margin between the two is vastly different, they are given the exact same reward. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. It's as if the master is less concerned, actually, with the numbers that are produced on the other side and the fact of their faithfulness with the work. No one... One ends up with 10 bags and another so much less, and yet exactly the same encouragement and celebration is given to both. But the story of the third servant goes very differently. Uh, Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. What's your, uh, what's your feeling about this third servant? I think I have an immediate sort of affection for the guy, actually. He just seems like a nervous guy. He's got a pretty rough boss. And, you know, he's given this task to do, but he sort of panics. He knows the boss is just a nightmare, and so he buries, he buries the gold in the ground. Like, the one thing he doesn't want to do is have the master come home and have nothing. Surely this is just... I mean, he seems a victim in this, doesn't he? Seems the victim of some cruel, bullying boss. Uh, I think the more you look at the story, the less that's the narrative here. There seems something quite dishonest about this guy, actually. I mean, for one thing, the way that the servant speaks about his master is just patently, like, just untrue, according to exactly what we know of the master here. And the master seems anything but a hard man, a harsh man. He knows his servants. He knows their abilities. He attends to those abilities. He doesn't give them more than what they can handle in this situation. He seems like a great boss, actually. And then when he returns, he's not 
he's not sort of counting up the money and saying, you've done well and you, you, I give you a C, just passable. No, he's overflowing with celebration for whatever they produced, as long as they did the work, as long as they were faithful, as long as they, you know, looked at his estate and thought that it was worth something. And then you've got to wonder what the servant was up to in the years that the master was away. Because whatever it was, it had nothing to do with the estate. He'd taken the gold he had to work in the estate and he'd buried it in the ground. Whatever he's doing has nothing to do with the master and the growth of that world. The master isn't someone who takes what isn't his. The servant here is accusing the master of being a thief, effectively. But he's been nothing like that. He's actually given what is his to others. And so the master says some words here, and perhaps we get in them a true insight into the character of this servant. You wicked and lazy servant. It's not a matter of a timid, fearful servant scared of his master. There's something impure about this guy's motives, something wicked about them. And there's an idleness, a laziness, by which we don't hear, oh, he's just tired, he's just this exhausted guy, he's, he's anxious. He's, I would say over the years that the master's away, he's not completely lazy, he's just lazy in the affairs of the state. Lazy in the affairs of the master, idle in those matters. Whatever, he's, probably, he's probably got a very busy life otherwise, it just has nothing to do with the master's work. You wicked and lazy servant. And the master said, look, if I was as harsh as you say I am, you would have put the money in the bank so that it was safe and produced something for me, but you didn't even do that. And so you no longer have a place in my household. Your place is outside. Your place is in the darkness. You don't get to enter into my happiness. Instead, you will feel the sadness and regret that comes when the door is shut behind you. Weeping, gnashing of teeth. Uh, as we read it, it's a lesson primarily for the disciples, isn't it? They are the first audience. They are to learn something from it. And what they're to learn is that in the time they have, they need to be doing the work of the Master. In the time they have, they need to grow the kingdom of their Master. It was the work of Jesus to call people to repentance and faith and the life of his kingdom. And Jesus now entrusts this to the disciples. His work is to become their work. And we actually see this at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, just as Jesus is preparing to go on his journey to the Father's side and he says to the disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Quite concretely there, his work of making disciples becomes their work in his absence. The disciples are entrusted with the work of mission. They are disciples expected to make more disciples. And in part, this parable to them is a wonderful encouragement that as the master goes away, he has given them all they need to do this work. He hasn't held back from them. He's not stingy with them. And in fact, Jesus says, I'm with you as you do this work. And they can be wonderfully encouraged that their master isn't tallying their profits and losses up, measuring one against the other, fantastically celebrating with them for the fact of their faithfulness in the work. You have been faithful with whatever you had. Well done. And they can be wonderfully encouraged by that. That as they do the work of making disciples, they will be welcomed into the joy of Jesus. But they must be about the work. If they bury it in the ground and retreat back into the life of the culture around them, step outside of the kingdom and say, no, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm one, I'm one like everyone else. I'm not about the work of Jesus. My, my ultimate allegiance isn't to him, at least not publicly. If that's how the disciples conduct themselves and step back into their culture, their Jewish culture again, 
if they become idle with the matters of the kingdom, they will be swept up in that great judgment that comes to Jerusalem. If they break from their allegiance with Christ, bury their vocation in the ground, they will find themselves swept up in the weeping and gnashing of teeth that comes when the Roman army descends on the temple. It's a parable that speaks first to them, but it speaks to us as well. All of the things in these chapters are a program for the disciples and a paradigm for all believers who wait for Jesus to come in judgment. What must we as a church do with the time we have? We must be about the work of our King. That great work of making disciples, of seeing many people come to know and love Jesus. Back at that conference I was talking about, uh, those grizzled, crooked-fingered senior ministers had heard the responses of all of us newbies. I hope so. I'm praying so. And then one of them said, let me, let me just say something. And he quoted Matthew 28 just from memory. He said, these are the words of Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have said. And therefore, I am with you till the very end of the age. He said, do you believe that? When Jesus says, go and make disciples, do you believe that's your, that's your calling? And we knew how to answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, and when Jesus says he is with you, do you trust him? Yeah. Why are you so nervous to say your church will grow? It's your job. Your master says he's with you as you do it. Why are you so nervous to say my church, my church must grow next year and the year after? And the year after that. And that was a pretty key moment for me. It really made me look with very fresh eyes at us and at this church I was responsible for. This fantastically healthy church by so many measures. Just well taught, well resourced. You know, a church of hundreds, 850 people saying, St. Luke's is my home. How easy it would be to say we've made it and how dangerous it would be to say we've made it. It's not the case that we've made it, it's the case that we have been entrusted. And we must be about the work of our master. It was after this that I thought we can't, we can't actually stay a church of hundreds not in the mission field that we have, not in Miranda that's growing around us, not in the Shire where people are flooding in. And certainly not with the task that Jesus explicitly leaves his disciples. Make more disciples. Grow my kingdom in my absence. And certainly not if he's promised to not actually be absent, but to be with us each and every day that we're about that task. We exist here so that many people will find new life in Jesus and grow as his wholehearted disciples. And by 2030, we want to grow from a church of hundreds to a church of thousands. Across the given week, we'll see six, seven hundred people gathering in worship here. We want to see 1,500 voices. We want to hear 1,500 voices praising our God here. 1,500 kids and youth and families Adults, grey hairs, no hairs, dyed hairs. They are numbers until we learn their names. Until we can look them in the eye and say, welcome home brother, welcome home sister. Now, Twelve young people gave their life to Jesus this Friday night. Friday night just gone. Happened here, happened in this room. A great ecosystem surrounded that moment of money being given, that we can employ people to do that work, of training happening of many young people into youth leaders, a great ecosystem that built this room, secured this property, a great ecosystem of people praying, army of parents and grandparents driving kids here, picking them up, 
It's the work of a church that that happened. The work of this church that that happened. As you think of those 12 young people who will join us in the kingdom, isn't that the joy of the master? And you feel that in your hearts. We have been welcomed into the joy of the master that that happened. And what I'm asking us all today is to recommit our hearts to that great work. To accept our responsibility as a richly entrusted church and to insist that our church be on mission above all else. There are many goods in church life. It is a place of joy and depth, deep friendship, peace, connections with one another. They are all good, but above all else, it is a place where the kingdom is to grow because that's the work we're entrusted with. And it may take a change of heart for many of us to really settle and say, we are about that work. And to ask, am I someone more likely to complain that I didn't get a car park or more likely to complain that there's no car parks reserved for new people? More concerned if you don't learn something new in a sermon or more concerned that the gospel wasn't stated clearly today for someone to hear it who needs it. more desiring of deep community, events with people like you, dinners organised for you, or more concerned that there's no moment where we can bring non-Christians here. Does a good day look like a a deep one-to-one conversation with someone close to you at church, or does a good day look like an awkward first-time conversation with someone who's never been to a church before? That's the sort of change of heart. To think for all the goods a church can do, the good we must be about is the great work of seeing people come to know Jesus and be saved. We're going to sing together a song that reminds us that was true of us us once. We came to Christ once. To remind us that we want to extend that to others. And then we're going to take a moment of personal prayer, just by ourselves, Russell will introduce that, but I want you to think through some of those questions here, whether today's a good day to recommit to the great mission we've been given. And then after that, we're going to have Luke Murray, our mission pastor, come up, and he's going to share with us some of the ways that we as a great ecosystem are on mission together at St. Luke's. Uh, But let's sing. Let's stand and sing. He 
called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began how savior displayed on a criminal's cross darkness rejoiced Jesus across Miranda and the Shire and the world. I'll give you a few moments to pray and think and reflect and I'll come back up again in a moment. Father, would you answer how these prayers all for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, well, I'm going to invite uh, Luke up because uh, today we've been uh, challenged and encouraged uh, by God's uh, call to be on mission. And so now we're going to take a moment with Luke uh, to explore what mission here looks like at St. Luke's. Luke, where does, mo- uh, where does mission fit into the life here of St. Luke's Miranda? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I find it helpful to think of mission as uh, the engine of our church. Uh, So God's Word, the Bible, is our foundation. And in God's Word, we meet a God who is on mission, uh, calling people, drawing people uh, to Himself. 
drawing us to him. And from that comes this uh, real sense of, sense of urgency and need. Uh, we're commanded, we're invited to be on mission. And so that, as an engine, propels us forward um, to see many new people find life in Jesus and grow as wholehearted disciples. So it's our engine. That's a pretty big picture. Uh, what does that look like for us here on the ground at St. Luke's? Yeah, so as we've heard uh, from Brett this morning, um, there's so many different ways that that plays out as we pray for things, we give financially to things. Um, but one thing I want to chat with us this morning about is actually how it impacts our time. Uh, it impacts our church calendar, both week to week and also uh, as a year. Uh, so uh, week to week, we have so many missional moments here at church. We have uh, craft on a Wednesday, playtime on a Friday, Thursday night, Thursday lunch, sorry, Thursday afternoon, in between lunch and dinner. <laughs> Thursday afternoon, kids, uh, there's youth group. Um, there's so many different missional moments each week. And then big picture, we have missional seasons as well, uh, such as Easter and Hype and TG and Christmas. And then kind of in between the weekly things and the big seasonal things, there are one-off things like young adults, dinners for eight before Easter uh, is coming up. And then there's men's events and women's events. There's all these different moments uh, in our church life that work together for mission. Uh, one of those uh, missional seasons you've spoken about is Easter. Uh, as we head towards Easter, what does that look like for us this year? Yeah, so I think it's easy to get overwhelmed with all these different options for doing mission and being involved at church. Um, but I think it's helpful to think of things as a, a pathway or a, a chain. So let's take Easter, for example. Um, for some people, Easter is a relative... At, some, for, at Easter time, it's pretty normal for some people to go to church. It's kind of seen like a religious holiday. So for some of our friends, asking them, inviting them to come to Easter will be warmly welcomed. And so um, you invite your friend to Easter, you meet them on the driveway, you help them find a seat. When they come to Easter, they will hear the gospel clearly explained and they will warmly be welcomed with a smiley face uh, into the life of St. Luke's. And then out of Easter, we're going to be inviting families to the Hype Kids Club. And then out of Hype, we'll invite them to the next thing. And the idea is that we're not putting all this missional pressure on one event, but rather we are inviting people to multiple things throughout our year that enables them to build trust in the gospel, build trust in our community, build and deepen relationships. And they kind of see that, wow, the gospel is a plausible way of life. Um, Jesus is real as it's lived out in us. And from those moments, then eventually it's our prayer that they come to church. Um, we're going to be relaunching uh, an evangelistic course where the gospel is clearly um, explained and so they can come to that. And eventually through being welcomed into our life here at St. Luke's, it's our prayer they find life in Jesus. Uh, that's really helpful to flesh out what it looks like for us as a church uh, to be doing that, to being, being on mission. Uh, what's next for us? What would be really helpful for us to do in the coming weeks? So in the coming weeks, um, you could pray, you should pray, <laughs> and invite someone to Easter. So at the back of the church, uh, on the table with the AGM stuff, uh, flyers to invite people to Easter. So you can pray for someone that you know, pray that you have the courage and the opportunity to invite them, uh, and then invite them to Easter. It's two steps. Grab a flyer. Let me pray uh, that we'll be uh, doing that and praying that and inviting people to see many more uh, people come and hear the new good news of the Lord Jesus. Let me pray. Father, we give you great thanks that you are a God who is on mission. And Father, thank you that you call us into that mission together as a church. Uh, Father, would you continue to use us and take us and use us for that purpose. God, grow in us a great heart for the lost. And Father, would you help all that we do around here to be guided to that purpose, to see many, many people come to know him. Our Father, would we be a people of great prayer, entrusting ourselves to you, knowing that you are working and you are with us as we go and share. And Father, as we particularly uh, think about those friends, those family members, uh, to invite along to Easter, Father, go before us. Hold 
Uh, help us to hold deep in our heart that you are with us as we go. And Father, in your mercy, may many people uh, come to Easter, come to Hype. Father, make that next step uh, to find new life in Jesus. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite uh, Marty up to continue in our time of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much, Heavenly Father, that uh, you have given all authority on heaven and earth to your Son, our King, the Lord Jesus. Uh, We thank you that as you send us out, uh, you, you're with us by your Spirit. Um, we thank you that we don't, we don't go alone, we don't go in our own strength. Uh, we thank you that uh, it's uh, nothing of us that brings salvation uh, to others, but uh, it's the good news of our Lord Jesus. Uh, we thank you for your abundant grace and mercy uh, poured out to his death and resurrection Uh, We thank you for that certain hope of new, everlasting life uh, in him. Uh, We thank you for the privilege of sharing that good news with those around us. Um, Thank you for the chance um, to to testify. Um, You could bring deliverance and the good news to others without us. We thank you that you use us and do it through us uh, as we testify to the Lord Jesus. Uh, We pray that you'd give us a deep conviction Uh, of the blessing that it is to testify of him Uh, even when it's scary uh, we pray you'd be working in our hearts and uh, uh, giving us gracious uh, words and um, courage to take the opportunities Um, we pray this morning uh, especially that you'd be growing us in mission together as a church Uh, we thank you for the time and the resources that you've blessed us with as your people Um, We ask that by your spirit and under your sovereign hand, you'd help us to be faithful with all you've given to us to see your kingdom grow. Uh, We pray you'd strengthen us to take every opportunity to be faithful witnesses uh, and disciples of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Uh, And as we look to the year ahead, uh, we pray you'd take us and use us in every season to support and serve and share Jesus together as a church uh, in the ways we've just been thinking about this morning. And uh, in your mercy, we pray you'd convict us by your spirit, give us boldness to to put these things uh, into action. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we uh, especially pray that you'd be with us uh, this Easter season. Uh, We thank you that, particularly around Easter and Christmas, that people are more open to consider coming to to meeting with us here at church. And we pray that as uh, flyers go out uh, around the Shire and uh, as we have conversations with friends and family and as we prepare and serve together at church, uh, we pray that you'd be bringing many people to consider the hope that's found in Christ. Uh, We pray that you'd go before us and use us by your spirit to see the lost brought near you by the good news of the Lord Jesus, uh, the good news of his death and resurrection and uh, the abundant forgiveness and new life that's found in him. Uh, And finally, we we ask that you'd be at work mightily in our holiday kids club uh, that's coming up, Hype. Uh, As you've done in the past, we pray you draw many children near at this time and they'd make connections here at church and hear of Christ. Uh, We pray those seeds that are sown there um, would take deep root in the hearts of many, um, many kids. Uh, We pray that you'd be using us uh, to uh, take lots of opportunities to serve at Hype and empowering us as a community to be on mission together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we ask that you'd hear all these prayers, uh, that your name might be proclaimed and that many might come to trust in Jesus, uh, all for the glory of your name. Amen.
our time together this morning in here. Uh, where to now? If you're new here with us, uh, we would love you to join us at our New Here flag, uh, meet our welcome team, uh, say hi to someone, uh, get known around here and be known by us. Uh, also, uh, morning tea, it's down the courtyard, please head down, continue in fellowship and community together. And finally, uh, to help those at our 1045 service, if you could grab your car and head off uh, by 10.30 or move your car, come back, stick around. That would be really, really helpful for us. Uh, well, I hope you've been encouraged and challenged uh, this morning, uh, particularly by Pret's question at the start. Will your church grow this year? Will your church grow this year? Uh, let me pray that God would work in us and use us and through us for that purpose. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the mission you have called us to. Father, thank you that the nations need to know. Father, thank you that you are with us as we go. And Father, in every way, would we see many, many new people come to find life in the Lord Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.